And now it's time for our Stockman Lecture on Pediatric Education and Workforce. This is a lectureship named after John, James Stockman III, past president and CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics, who revolutionized pediatric medical education. This year, the AAP and ABP executive committees chose Samantha Kennedy, a second-year medical student at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University in Camden, New Jersey, to give this lecture. Samantha's education is interlaced with insight from her experiences as a pediatric chronic illness patient. She co-led the Patient Advisory Board for a National Pediatric Learning Health Network from 2012 to 2015, and co-created a peer-to-peer -peer social network and care improvements with patients, families, and clinical teams. As she advances in her medical education, Samantha now strives to navigate the challenge of communicating openly and empathetically with patients and families, and to keep her promises to her younger self. Ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Kennedy. To the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Board of Pediatrics, and to Dr. Carol Lannan, my friend and mentor, thank you for the invitation to join you here today and for believing in me and for believing in amplifying and sharing the voices of patients and families. It is that spirit in pediatrics that so strongly believes that all of us, even the youngest of kids, have a mind and a voice deserving of being engaged in healthcare and health that drives my interest in pediatrics as a student. And Dr. Stockman, as you know, you helped create the Collaborative Chronic Care Network of Pediatric Inflammatory Bowel Disease Care Improvers that has given me and many of my young friends hope as teens and young adults with chronic illnesses and tremendously informed my education. It is too great a thing to inhabit the word thank you. We are connected in more ways than one, and it is an honor I'll carry with me to be here today speaking on behalf of your legacy. The nadir of my first year of medical school came when I felt vulnerability at a time I expected to feel pride. The pediatric unit on the sixth floor of the university hospital is even on the skyline with the crest of the medical school a block away. The medical school rises tall along a thoroughfare where it drowns a series of small brown stones in the reflected light that gleams from those windows that encase it. A single tower sits atop one side of the rectangle, bearing a flame, as if to say, here is light, here is clarity. One day last spring, I stood beside an adolescent not much younger than myself on the pediatric unit and looked out across those brownstones at the flame-topped building. How lucky this young patient is, I thought, to be admitted to a room that looks at the beauty of the medical school. And as I pointed out to him the parts I know and I love, I couldn't imagine it could appear any less magnificent to him than it did to me. The other side of the sixth floor is an endoscopy unit. And it is there I found myself in a bed just like his only a few months ago. I had completed my first year of medical school and begun a new round of sparring with the chronic disease I had been diagnosed with nine years ago when I was a teenage visitor to a pediatric floor. Now, here I was on the other side of the double doors in a holding area with adults three times my age. There was one thing familiar here a view of a red and orange flame atop a glittering rectangular building out the window beside my bed. But it no longer struck me as magnificent. Despite my knowing every corner and hallway and study nook of that building, it felt foreign. I could remember the girl who strutted those halls for a year, confident and tenacious in her white coat. But I didn't feel like her at all with two itchy gowns draped around my body. If I thought my white coat failed to complement my small frame, the gowns obscured it and made me feel stripped of my dignity. I had never before felt such dissonance between my year-long identity as a medical student and my nine-year identity as a patient. 
When I was 14, I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, a diagnosis that profoundly changed how I interact with my body, but even more significantly rattled my relationship with it, as both the disease and its treatment stretched me in ways that were uncomfortable to grow. In college, I connected with a National Pediatric Quality Improvement Collaborative of pediatric caregivers, patients, and parents. And this was a platform through which I was able to co-lead advocacy efforts and try to create meaning out of my experiences. From there, an appreciation of how people make change happen led me here to medical school. And most of the time, it has felt really good to step up and challenge myself to help and to advocate. But that morning, as I looked down at the IV dripping into my hand and considered the recent completion of my first year, I felt disingenuous. Remember this, I begged myself. Remember how very distant and different it looks right now. Remember that how you feel right now, alone and anxious and unsure how and where you should look when someone swings back the curtain next, will be easy to see as nothing but dust over the crux of a case to dissect with your intellect in the fall. Have you forgotten this past year how little comfort it is to hear about the research and education and a future with great cures when you're lying in a hospital bed on the other side? Knowing that whatever great place of research and education is out there is not somewhere someone like you in a gown can go or is told you belong. It is not that my medical school separates clinical care from humanism. If anything, I believe us to be one of the most progressive schools in the country. But for five months this summer and fall, as I grappled with a new normal, I felt divided. See, when I see a patient in our student clinic, I work on whittling down the story I am told into less and less words to write a simple note. But this summer, I easily filled a pocket notebook with thousands of words that only approximated how I felt, and still didn't tell a cohesive story when I gave up the arduous process of recording everything. And as I tried to tell this story to clinicians, every time I was afraid that the person in the white coat, just like mine, would take my words and whittle them down into words so small my story would be unrecognizable to the truth, just like I might have once upon a clinic day. The only similarity I could think of between my identity as a student who belonged across the way and as a patient relegated to the corner bed was our shared fear of not being heard. It was only that vulnerability that I could imagine to build a bridge from my bed across the way to the lecture hall. And as I tried to think how to ameliorate my feelings uh, of vulnerability as a medical student with my entirely different feelings of vulnerability as a chronic illness patient, I settled on a simple sentence I'd found comfort in weeks earlier when I felt overwhelmed with fear. We don't get to choose our challenges. I didn't get to choose ulcerative colitis when I was 14. I inherited a world foreign and frustrating. And I can remember the first night, really vividly still, nearly every moment. It was April 22nd, 2008, and I was 14 years old and eight months to the day, and I was hospitalized. I sat cross-legged on my hospital bed, and I looked out the window at the couple stars I could make out, and I said, to no one in particular, but out loud, I don't know what challenges are going to come my way. But if I can be okay, if I can just be okay, I will do something good with what I have. See, I thought being okay would come down to how quickly I would need to come back. I thought being okay was a function of my medication and how many relapses I would have, and whether I would have to be called complicated. But the absence or presence of my challenges in years since has not made me okay or not okay. 
For me, the funny thing about medicine is that we have so many toys and gadgets, and they can make a patient better. But only a person can help a person heal. If I don't take on that responsibility as a doctor, how am I a caregiver? What made me okay? Or rather, who made me okay? She had a name. Sarah was an intern, and the next morning she came and sat after rounds on the edge of my bed, and she told me her story. She made herself vulnerable to me. She took off her white coat, and she told me about what it was like for her to be a girl in a gown like me and get to know a world of sickness, foreign and frustrating. I never saw Sarah after that hospitalization, but nine years ago, she built a bridge that still endures. Sometimes I think I've never really stopped living April 22nd, 2008, over and over again. And in that way, there's a continuous bridge between the girl I was and who she grew to be. I'm finding out what challenges she didn't know lay ahead. And as I worry whether I'm meeting her standards as I meet our challenges, sometimes it can be easier to keep her as a speck on the horizon than within arm's length. I'm always going to be a patient before I am a doctor. And when I'm in the deepest trenches of my illness, I'm not always so confident and bold as I am in my white coat. It doesn't feel so grand to be a chronic illness patient when your accomplishments are measured not on resumes, but in milestones collected and hope reached. I will always be a patient before I am a doctor. And yet, when I started medical school, I wanted little more than to sideline that part of my brain that acts and thinks like a patient. I found it easier to speak of myself as having been a patient in the past, despite the fact that my illness is ongoing and affects my life in present tense. The day of my endoscopy, upset and defeated, I felt incredible dissonance between my identities as a patient and a student doctor. I started my second year of medical school in August, my body again treading through a new normal. As I grappled with many of the same challenges that I struggled with nine years ago, I felt bothered by the premise that I'm somehow exceptional as a patient because I stand before you today as a medical student. I have been imperfectly adherent. I emotionally struggle to accept where I am limited. I have disengaged in my own care when I have hit a threshold of frustration. My actions, or lack thereof, have been the root cause of at least one of my relapses. And to tell you all this is to simultaneously have to accept it myself as I enter a profession where I envy perfection and expect of others what I know I struggle to do myself. I am not the paradigm of a perfect patient. I'm a real person, and so are you and your patients. And it is a hard thing to be. But when I say that I'm proud to be a patient first and foremost, I'm not reflecting on my successes, but on those failures. They force me to think more complexly about the human aspects of my studies and my practice. The more I recognize my own humanity as a patient, the better I am able to care for others in return. Being a patient, I think, is making me a better doctor. In acknowledging that I struggle to accept my own disease, to care for others as, uh, to care for others as I expect to care for myself, and to meet the expectations that my colleagues and caregivers have set for me, I have to recognize the humanity of others beyond myself. And in being open with my classmates and co-developing forums for the development of our training in humanism, I have importantly recognized how unexceptional I am. It is true I liked Sarah, that resident who gave me the spark of hope on the first day because she struck me as a paragon of a beautiful future I too could have, where my disability would be reason for and not barrier to my career of service. But I admired Sarah 
because she bared those vulnerabilities to me. I never considered what it must have felt like for her to do that, how it goes against the grain of a profession where I too have fell into the trap of wishing myself invincible in the costume I wear. I don't want the challenge of practicing what I preach as a patient advocate because it is hard. Ensuring my values as a student and patient align requires introspection and self-awareness that are too easy to shelf. But I try every day to see every patient as a reflection of my own humanity, the brokenness of which I recognize all too well. It is there I build the bridge that makes me feel whole between my own vulnerability as a patient and my new vulnerabilities as a student. And between my understanding of the world as a patient and this new place I sit and try to understand my patient's way of seeing the world as a provider of care. It can be emotionally exhausting to be aware of my own experiences when I'm focused on another person's story, but I aspire to a career with high standards and this is a challenge I chose. I know you to be thoughtful and kind and knowledgeable, and I aspire to be that. I, I can only ask of you that you don't remember my voice here as an inspiration, but as a call for you to acknowledge and include your own vulnerabilities into your work and thought processes. Back at school, I have 79 classmates who are no less exceptional than I am. And we were accepted to medical school because we each have a story we believe in that guides our actions. I'm aware of the expectation that our clinical rotations are going to dampen our empathy, but when I look ahead, I don't see a lack of empathy, but an abundance thereof in care that pioneered the meaning of family-centered, relentlessly advocates for patients, and where national organizations like AAP and ABP are championing co-creation with patients and families. I choose to play a role in the cultural revolution that is innovative collaborative care, to advocate unrelentingly that clinicians, parents, and patients should stand shoulder to shoulder in medical care. I choose to pervasively uphold the understanding that I know differently, but not better, as a caregiver than a patient. I choose to openly acknowledge my identity as a patient to my colleagues so I grow in the knowledge that we're all more than we appear, to strangers to challenge the illusion that there's no room for disability in medical education. And when the opportunity is right one day, maybe to a patient so that I can be someone Sarah. I choose to remember that I wear the same imperfect body under my white coat as I do in a gown. I choose to care for myself or try to go as I would ask my patient to care for herself, demonstrating my respect and dedication to improving others' health by taking care of my own. And I choose to remember the weight of the expectations I carry when I now set expectations for others. Most of all, I choose to remember that I came to medical school as a patient. And while I will leave with skills I didn't have before, I wasn't broken then, and I'm no more whole now. Thank you.